Andres. Uh, greetings. This from... meeting is being recorded. Uh, greetings from the Czech Republic, uh, from a retreat house near Prague. We have a retreat with our catechumens. In this year, we have 90 catechumens, adults, and uh, now we have a, a, a weekend together. So, Europe and the world are going through a very difficult time. Climate change, pandemic of diseases, and Russia's military attack against the fundamental pillars of our civilization will have long-term global, economic, political, social, and moral consequences. No wonder there is growing worry and anxiety. Political populists, extremists, nationalists, and religious fundamentalists are exploiting this fear. More than ever, humanity needs the social capital of trust and solidarity to survive. Religion and religious communities have been a source of hope for centuries. Today, at a time when this role is so really needed, many religious communities in Europe are in difficulties and crisis, especially crisis of credibility. I was recently asked by an Austrian journalist to what extent the state of church today resembles the changes in the natural environment. The icebergs are melting. My answer had two parts. On the one hand, there is needed an analogy. Uh, on the one hand, there is indeed an analogy uh, the form of the church resembling a massive, immobile, called Colossus, is indeed melting due uh, to the change in the culture and social climate. And this process is irreversible. Churches, monasteries, and seminaries are being emptied and even closed, and tens of thousands are leaving the church. The dark shadow of the recent past are depriving the church of credibility. The situation of our church today, on the threshold of postmodernity, strongly resembles the situation at the beginning of modernity, just before the Reformation. The scandals of psychological, spiritual, and sexual abuse have played a similar role today as the scandals of the sale of indulgences in Martin Luther's time. As then, so today, these scandals, which at first seemed like a marginal phenomena, have turned out to be an alarming symptom of a serious illness in the whole system of the church, requiring a profound reform. Pope Francis, diagnosed the disease of the system as clericalism, the abuse of power and authority. Jesus called this disease the leaven of Pharisees. According to Pope Francis, the way out of this dead end of the church is 
synodality, the transformation of the church from a bureaucratic hierarchical system into a dynamic network of communication, a shared journey, common way, sin odos. The Pope emphasized that this past must remain open like the past of the father of faith, Abraham, who set out on journey also, he did not know where he was going. During the process of preparation for the synod on synodality, new horizons on this path have emerged. According to the encyclical Fratelli Tutti, the goal of this journey is universal fraternity not only a greater efficiency and transparency in the functioning of the church's apparatus. It means that synodality cannot be just an internal affair of the Catholic Church. It must become a credible invitation to a common journey in a broadly ecumenical sense. The universal fraternity, the unity of mankind in Christ, is certainly an eschatological goal. But on the way to it, fundamental steps must be taken to overcome the barriers of relations between churches, religions, and cultures. It is at this time when we hear the words from Moscow, from Kremlin, that have not been heard since Hitler and Goebbels, including threat of nuclear war, that we need to protect the great dream of peace and justice. The great dreams that God sends to our hearts in the dark nights of history are meant to awaken, inspire, and strengthen us in our mission in the war. Pope Francis is referring to the idea of a church that does not remain behind the walls of its certainties in a splendid isolation from the outside world, but rather goes out sacrificially and courageously to places where people are physically, socially, psychologically, and spiritually wounded, trying to dress and heal the wounds. The church should be, according Pope Francis, a field hospital. This metaphor needs to be more developed. The field hospital needs the facilities of a proper hospital, which has its own research facilities, provides quality diagnostics, and is dedicated to prevention, therapy, and rehabilitation. As a hospital, the church should keep before its eyes not only the suffering of individuals, but also the collective ills of today's societies and civilizations. For too long, the church has chiefly adopted a moralistic approach to society's illness. It takes now it to discover and exercise the therapeutic potential of faith. 
The diagnostic function should be performed by discipline, which I call chirology. The art of reading and interpreting the signs of the times, the theological hermeneutic of the events in society and culture. Chirology should pay special attention uh, to the times of crisis and changes in culture paradigms. Chirology develops the method of spiritual discernment that is an important part of the spirituality of St. Ignatius, contemplation and evaluation of the present state of the world and our task in it. The role of prevention is akin to what is sometimes called pre-evangelization, nurturing the culture and moral soil in which the seed of faith can be planted in order to take root. Respect for human rights, the struggle for social justice, or the concern for stability of family life are also part of pre-evangelization, constituting an interesting earthly side of hope. If the church did not accept its co-responsibility for the world and strive for the cultivation of society, but merely devoted itself to explicitly religious activities, it would render these activities inauthentic and sterile. The vita activa and the vita contemplativa belong together. To separate one from the other is to damage both. In a time of hate ideologies and fake news, it is necessary to build an immunity system and create a favorable climate for the healthy development of the human person and society, to develop an integral ecology. In this field, Christians must work in solidarity with many secular institutions and initiatives. We cannot claim a monopoly of healing the world. What we might term rehabilitation care is primarily needed in societies that have long been wounded by social and political conflicts or by wars or repressive regimes where the social capital of trust and solidarity has been depleted where traumas, unrevealed guilt, and broken relationship between people and human groups persist for a long time, it is up to Christians to apply their experience to the practice of repentance, reconciliation, and forgiveness. Here, I would like to return to the metaphor of iceberg. Carl Gustav Jung once compared the human psyche, the human soul, to an iceberg, the visible, conscious, rational part of the human soul is very thin. The most massive and important part lies in the depths of the personal 
and collective unconscious. I am convinced that the most important structure of Christianity are not the, etern the external institutional forms that are now in crisis, but the deeper dimension of faith, for which we usually use the ambiguous term spirituality. Spirituality is the lifestyle of faith. It fills virtually the entire space of the fides qua, act of faith. It is the sap of the tree of faith. It nourishes and animates both dimension of faith, the spiritual life, the inner religious experience, the way in which faith is lived and reflected upon, but also the outward practice of faith, the embodiment, incarnation of faith in culture and society. I consider this dimension of faith to be crucial, especially in the time ahead. Many people today find church institutions untrustworthy and the preaching of doctrine incomprehensible and impossible. Yet Christian spirituality speaks to their hearts. Perhaps it is precisely the crisis, the shaking and dissolution of external institutional structures that can help us to, dis to rediscover those deep structures of Christianity. And through their revival, there can be revival and not only the renewal of the church. The life of faith needs its institution aspect, but the renewal of the church cannot consist only in the reform of institutions, certain parts of the catechism and the code of canon law, but must begin and be constantly accompanied by a revival of spirituality. What we need most today are vibrant, radiant centers of living, healthy spirituality. I'm just now in one of them in our country. I believe there, that, there, that here lies the main task for religious communities, for the monasteries, for the orders. I do not expect the renewal of the church primarily from the traditional parish communities. With the current crisis of priestly vocations, it is impossible to maintain network of local parishes. Trying to supplement the thinning ranks of priests by importing priests from Poland, Africa, and Asia cannot be a lasting solution. Many voices are being heard in the national synodal processes that our for the ordination of viri probati has come. If the charisma of celibacy were to return to its original natural setting, to the religious orders, it would certainly make a great contribution to the culture of celibacy. 
but even the weary probati will probably not bring a sufficient influx of priestly vocations. The crisis of the priesthood goes deeper. It is a crisis of identity due to the changes in the role of clergy in the church and society. The question of the ordination of women is beyond the scope of this lecture. It seems to me only that the main argument against the ordination of women, Jesus chose only men, is not sustainable. Jesus also chose only circumcised Jews among his 12. So do we have the right to ordain Italians, Germans, of Japanese. It will be, it will have to be asked honestly whether the argument against the ordination of women are really theological nature, a theological in nature, or rather psychological and to which extent they are marked by cultural stereotypes of patriarchal and masculine societies. Especially at a time when many local parishes are disappearing, it is necessary to build centers of spiritual life that offer not only the usual liturgy, but courses of contemplative prayer, spiritual accompaniment, and the possibility of an open sharing of spiritual experiences. Some synodal circles were definitive steps along this path, where the practice of synodality developed. The practice must continue after the synod of bishops in Rome, especially if the synod fails to meet the high expectations of many of the believers. The eventual frustration of two great expectations should not lead to resignation or schism. I can offer my own pastoral experience. In an academic parish in Prague, over the several decades of its existence, we have baptized several thousand adults, mostly university students, after a solid almost two year catechetical preparation. We have a lecture every week and some weekends together in the spiritual center, the former Capucin Monastery near Prague, where I am now. However, many of the newly baptized after returning from their studies in Prague experience cultural shock and great disappointment because of the difference between the vibrant academic parish and the semi dead local parish in the countryside, where the old priest had 20 years the same preaching and so on. However, when several spiritual centers have been established, where people go to for contemplative curses, creative spiritual exercises, long-term spiritual accompaniment, and open discussions about the future of the church, converts find trends to overcome crisis, and many spiritual seekers come 
some unbaptized uh, people are coming here to this center and also uh, non-Catholics and non-baptized. There are some Protestant, um, uh, Protestant pastors coming for uh, the Ignatius spiritual exercises and so on. So we, uh, we have something to offer from our tradition, but it must be presented in a new uh, way. For example, we have the retreat with films. The people are one week in absolutely silence and twice a day they see a very strong film and then it's time for um, inner reflecting of the message of the film, how it connected with my emotions, with my belief, with my faith. And there is one priest and one lady, psychotherapeut, uh, for some consultations. And this is the way to create the centers for spiritual life. And I think especially the religious orders can often answer. Uh, so, uh, one evening a week in our parish is reserved uh, for a sacrament of reconciliation and pastoral counseling. Over the years, it has become clear that the people of different generations need other forms of spiritual accompaniment far more than a sacrament of reconciliation. They need the opportunity to bring their pains, questions, doubts, wounds, not just sins. We began to use religious sisters and brothers and lay people, both men and women, with theological and psychotherapeutic qualifications. Often, Christians from other churches and unbaptized, spiritual-seeking people also come. Here I see a great field of action for sisters and brothers from religious orders, the ministry of spiritual accompaniment. The vanguard of this ministry of the church, the ministry of spiritual accompaniment, is so-called categorical pastoral care. The ministry of chaplains in hospitals and in prisons and in the army, it can also take form of spiritual accompaniment of people in all kinds of difficult life situation or supporting those who are engaged in similarly demanding ministry to others and are at the risk of burn out. The chaplain's ministry is indeed for everyone, not just for the faithful. It differs both from the traditional pastoral ministry of clergy, such as parish priests who visit their parishioners in the hospitals and administrators for sacraments, and from mission in sense of converting non-believers and winning new members of the church. It is also different from the work of psychologists and social workers. It is a spiritual ministry, a spiritual accompaniment. Spiritual ministry is, ba is based on the assumption that the spiritual realm is an anthropological constant that is intrinsic to human beings and helps to shape their humanity. The spiritual is concerned with meaning, both the meaning of life and the meaning of a particular life situation. People not, need not only to know in theory, but also to actually live life and experience the fact that the inner life, with all its joys and pains, has meaning. 
the need for meaning and awareness of meaningfulness are among people's basic existential needs, especially in difficult life situations. The awareness of meaningfulness is often shaken and needs to be resurrected. We need awareness of the meaning of life as much as we need air, food and drink, and we cannot live permanently in inner darkness and disorientation. The Ministry of Spiritual Accompaniment straddles the boundary between the religious and secular spheres. It may draw on spiritual treasures of the religion, but it lives in a non-ecclesiastical secular space and must express itself in a way uh, what is, which is understandable for the environment. It must transcend the boundaries of the church's language game. Jesus commanded us to love all people, to become neighbors. One of the faces of love is respect for others' otherness. Love is the space of freedom that we open up to others so that they can be truly and fully themselves. A space of trust, of security, of acceptance, a space enabling our clients to develop what is most precious in themselves, to become themselves. It is only when we have experience being accepted and loved just as we are, that we learn to accept and love others. The Royal Road of Spiritual Accompaniment, its Alpha and Omega, is the cultivation of a contemplative attitude towards the world and one's own life. The mission of the Spiritual Companion is to say, to clients, what Jesus said when he first addressed his future disciples, launch out into the depth, the deep, and wait in silence. But they must also be taught how to do it, to be initiated into the art of contemplation, spiritual accompaniers, do not have to be spiritual in the sense of ordained ministers of the church, but they must be spiritual people, people who do not just uh, live on the surf surface of life, but draw from their inner depth. Let us now turn uh, to a remarkable phenomenon of the post-secular scene, the ever-increasing number of people who, when asked what religion they subscribe to, answer that they subscribe to none. Sociologists have given this growing set of people the collective label of nonness, nonness, nonness are the third largest group on the planet today after Christians and Muslims. They represent an extraordinary diverse range of opinions and existential orientation of beliefs and faith. Sometimes what is too hastily described as the atheization of society, like the Czech society, for example, actually means that people's spiritual life has evolved away from the form offered by the churches. The demand for a more mature and specialized form of spiritual life 
outstrips what the churches have to offer, which is too narrow and stereotypical. The most interesting part of the nuns are the spiritual seekers. Sociologists distinguish between dwellers and seekers. It would be wrong to divide people into believers and seekers because dwellers and seekers are found both among believers and non-believers. I'm convinced that the future of Christianity will depend primarily on the extent to which Christians relate to the spiritual seekers among the nuns. In the corridor of the theological department of the Harvard University, a few years ago, I found a poster inviting to a conference of course called the nuns and the nuns, nuns, sisters, and the nuns, a dialogue between the sisters of religious orders and people without denominational affiliation. I suppose it was a good initiative. The crisis of our time, including the crisis of the church, are opportunities to fulfill the words of Jesus, sell your positions and follow me, possessions and follow me. This means leave your certainties and accept this poverty as a liberation, an opportunity for a new beginning. It is great task of religious orders to witness to the value of poverty, material and spiritual poverty. Many people are afraid of poverty in the face of the difficult economic problems of our time. A distinction must be made between poverty and misery. Misery is an evil that we must fight, striving for a just and solidarity, solidarity society. However, the crisis of a society of wealth and waste and the need to adopt more modest, ascetic way of life is not a cause for panic. This is where the church and especially the religious communities should set an example. We live in a time of changes and crisis in the world and in the church. Let us try to understand these changes soberly, without panic. Jesus says, do not be afraid. Do not have faith. <laughs> the task of the church is to proclaim these words and be witnessed by our resilience in the face of fear and despair. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you very much, Professor Halik, uh, for as you might have heard so often after your speeches for such a, a challenging and inspiring talk. Uh, and I suppose uh, now we could uh, go ahead by maybe asking some questions or some reflections upon what you've just uh, said. And I invite everyone join in if you have questions to not be afraid to ask uh, this is a great opportunity to ask uh, uh, to professor halik uh, mm -hmm. one thing that uh, i was uh, interested in and maybe you could professor you are do you hear me <laughs> uh, okay i'm just going for <laughs> yeah i presume that you hear me Okay. Yes, yes. 
Okay, uh, one thing that I I I am in a way interested is to if you could develop a little more on the tension. You spoke about spirituality as the main. Oh, great, uh, Professor! You can see us now. Uh, yes, I, I think yes. The, yes. Okay. Wonderful. <laughs> 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 Very good, very good. Finally, it's been done. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so uh, the, before we open up to, or while we are thinking questions or reflections upon what you just said, I just want to invite to uh, expand a little bit, maybe uh, on the question of institution and spirituality, uh, because um, I, I think personally, I would agree with you that the spirituality is the, um, uh, place where we need to work and um, go deeper and, and kind of work on the spirituality aspect, but the institutional aspect and uh, is still there and quite strong and not without purpose as well. So there is a tension between this institutional aspect and the spirituality uh, aspect. Uh, could you go a little maybe further in this discussion? How how can we reform while dealing with the institutional aspects and not losing anything that might be value? And especially like thinking about religious life, there is a lot of history of uh, institutions that have been working very deeply in the society and, and giving very additional value to the society. So uh, how can we uh, reform go deep in spirituality and at the same time, what do we do with the institutional aspects? Mm. Uh, of course, we need uh, to, uh, to transform also uh, many aspects of the institution of the church. And, but uh, it is not possible without the spiritual deepening. And I think uh, the both must go together. Um, I'm, uh, I really think that our times is very similar to the time before the Reformation, but they were two reformations. And at um, the same time, uh, the Protestant Reformation and also the Catholic Reformation. They were the people like the Ignatius of Loyola, Teresa of Avila, they were reformers. And it was also an attempt to reform the church. And I think we should develop um, this tradition. And um, uh, yes, uh, without these uh, new spiritual impulses, all the reconstruction of the institutions is for nothing. But um, it must go uh, both together. So uh, we need uh, the uh, reformation of the of the of the, uh, the institution, but not without the, the the spiritualities. And I think that uh, the centers of the reformations should be those centers of spirituality, like uh, the monasteries uh, thousand. Um, uh, uh, 500 years ago and there were the centers for for uh, radiant centers they, they radiated um, uh, the, uh, the christianity and it was uh, the real evangelization uh, we have heard many things about the new evangelization but perhaps the uh, new evangelization was not very new and not very deep going. So they were practically no um, real fruits of this. And uh, so I think that uh, from the spiritual centers could, uh, could uh, be, we could radiate some, some, some new energy. Thank you very much, Professor. Now we we expect that there'll be a lot more more interesting questions uh, you know, to be answered from the auditory over here. So please. And I I understood the importance of dialogue and openness. Um, 
to the new forms of spirituality and uh, people that have other ways of thinking and feeling uh, life, uh, God, all that. My question is how to ensure that this dialogue and this relation with other spiritualities is not a kind of syncretic and non-characterized um, new identity? Uh, and how can we ensure that the announcement, the clear announcement of Christ will be present uh, in this relationship of uh, openness and dialogue? Thank you. Yes. Thank you for the question, important question. Uh, uh, yes, I think this uh, call for dialogue of the Second Vatican Council came a little bit too late. Uh, this uh, reconciliance with the um, experience of uh, modernity came too late in the time when the modernity was ended. And uh, so uh, the first, uh, the important first sentence of Gaudium et Spes that um, uh, the uh, joys and sorrow of uh, Contemporary men are the joys and sorrow and anxieties of the church. It sounds like a, um, uh, like a, a wolf of uh, like a marital wolf, like a uh, wolf um, uh, in in uh, in the marriage. Uh, the church promised uh, the fidelity, love. Uh, to the modern men. But I think it came a little bit too late that the modern men um, thought that the church at the time was not a very attractive uh, bride. <laughs> it was a little bit too old and very attractive bra uh, uh, so a bride. Uh, so um, I think uh, that we must uh, we must uh, put the question on uh, the identity and authenticity of Christianity um, uh, in a new uh, um, uh, standing. Um, and uh, uh, I think that the core of the identity of Christianity is the Easter story of uh, death and resurrection. So I think uh, it is uh, the real core of Christianity, death and resurrection. And uh, I think that death, the passions, and there's the cross is continuing in the history of the church. There is a passio continua. And sometimes we must go through the dark night, uh, through the cross. And uh, many things are, uh, are, are dying. Uh, no panic. It is part of our uh, identity. It's part of the story of, uh, of, uh, of uh, the Christianity. Uh, many things must die. And then came the resurrection, which is not just to return to the past, but a radical transformation. And I think our task today is to find uh, Christ, um, resurrected Christ, who is coming to us in a transform, in a transform form. Uh, resurrection is surprising. It's a shock. Uh, so the Maria Magdalene was not able to recognize Christ. And um, uh, Apostle Thomas uh, needed to recognize his wounds. So uh, we must uh, seek the Galilee of today where we uh, will find uh, the resurrected Christ, who is coming to us in so many, um, in so, many. so uh, tradition. Yes, we have the, 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 the our task is the fidelity to tradition, but tradition is uh, nothing static. Né? Tradition is a process of creative um, uh, reinterpretation. 
uh, of uh, of the message of the gospel. Uh, so um, I think we don't need to be very anxious about the changes. If we uh, yes. Uh, we need uh, what is in the Jesuit uh, spirituality, the discernment of the spirit. So we, we need this contemplative approach to the events of uh, in us and in the society and um, uh, in, um, in a deep contemplation to recognize what are just the spirit of the time, the zeitgeist, and the uh, sign of the times, the spirit of the time, the zeitgeist, it is the language of the world. The sign of the times is the language, is the speech of God in the events of the society. And um, uh, especially we, the spiritual people must develop and offer this art of uh, of uh, uh, of discovering of uh, uh, of the distinction between this. So, um, in the contemplation, we should recognize where are really the uh, new challenges of God in uh, this culture, in this society, and it needs people, they go deeper and deeper. So, uh, yes, uh, we need this uh, dialogue, we need this encounter with other cultures, and we need the courage to discover Christ, who is coming, and uh, his identity are the wounds, his identity are um, his voice, like the Mary Magdalene, his identity is that he is coming in a, a strange, a strange uh, in a strange person, uh, like uh, uh, the way to a mouse. Um, he is coming in the um, last brothers and sisters. They need our help. So this, we, our task is courageously. Uh, uh, discover, find the resurrected Christ who is coming to us in a very, very different form. Uh, form. And we have the intelligent face. So the intelligence is interlegere, to, 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 to distinguish it very, uh, very deeply. Mm, yeah. Thank you, thank you. Uh, the group in front of you is quite diverse in terms of languages and all sorts of ways. So there might be some questions, not only in English, but in French and Italian, and maybe uh, some other languages like Czech, because we have a Czech representatives here as well. But uh, please, <laughs> the floor is open to ask further questions uh, or reflections on what you just heard. Lei ha fatto più volte allusione alla esperienza della riforma nel Cinquecento. La mia domanda potrebbe essere anche di aiuto di guardare di più presto la storia del popolo giudaico. Popolo... Se vediamo the history of the of the Jews. Uh -huh. Se vediamo nel 587 prima di Cristo la distruzione del tempio eh, l'esilio babilonico ha capovolto completamente la nozione di fede di Dio nel, nel popolo giudaico e mi sembra questo potrebbe essere per noi anche un punto di riferimento anche nel diciamo di intenderci sempre più solidari col popolo giudaico mi sembra questo molto importante anche perché anche adesso si vede che riprende un anti-giudaismo 
un, un, uno spirito antisemitico che qui la Chiesa deve essere molto 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 chiara in questo punto che ci sentiamo vi, molto vicini, solidari col, con la storia del popolo giudaico. Yes, I understand, yeah. Um, I think uh, it's really very important uh, that we uh, should feel our, uh, uh, our solidarity uh, with uh, the people of Israel and also uh, to recognize uh, some similarities in our history. And I think very important moment in the history of Judaism was the destruction of the Temple of Jerusalem uh, in uh, 70 um, after, uh, after uh, Jesus Christ. Um, uh, because uh, then they were uh, practically two parallel heritage of this Israel, uh, of this um, nation, of, of this religion of Israel. One was the, uh, the Judaism after uh, the Judaism and exile, and the Christianity. They both um, offered a, a radical new interpretation, uh, new hermeneutics of this um, uh, tradition uh, of the, uh, and also of the, of the um, Old Testament of uh, the Hebrew Bible. Um, uh, for Jews, uh, it was necessary uh, to, um, uh, to um, uh, reinterpret so many important um, uh, commandments of the Mosaic law. Uh, so, for example, uh, there were no temples, so there were no, um, uh, no the Holocaust, no, no, not the, um, uh, all, all these um, uh, sacrifices in the temple. And, and then uh, the, um, the rabbis said uh, the prayer um, uh, of uh, Jews is instead of this sacrifice. And uh, the table of the Jewish family is now instead of the altar in Jerusalem temple. So it was so, 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 so creative. And we need something similar now. Um, uh, I was very happy when um, Pope Benedict uh, spoke about uh, this courtyard of the Gentiles. Uh, we need um, to have in the church some place for the people. They are not fully identified with us and so forth. But now, in uh, 20 years, the situation is changing. Uh, we are not in the situation we can offer some, um, uh, some courtyard of the Gentiles. Uh, the temple of the church, one, um, this, uh, uh, this stable form of the church is destroyed like the temple of Jerusalem. And we must go outside. Uh, it was a very important sentence of Cardinal Bergoglio uh, a day before his election. He said, yes, um, in, the, in the New Testament, uh, we, um, uh, we read, Jesus is knocking on the door. But today, the Jesus, uh, Jesus is knocking from inside. He wants to go outside, outside of, of, of the church, and we must follow him. Uh, he's going to the poor, to the wounded, and so it is this idea of, of, of the hospital. So I think it's really uh, the situation of, of our time. Uh, the, the traditional, um, traditional form of, of a temple is over, uh, the Christianitas and so on, uh, the, um, uh, it's over. Uh, now we uh, must go outside and to, and, uh, and to, uh, like, uh, to, to go to the needed and, and to the seekers and so on. Uh, we need to transform the uh, reinterpretation of, uh, of our message, like, 
uh, was the, the in, in, in Judaism. Um, it was the Parisis né? and, and the, and the Rambais, they have the courage to um, discover a radical new form of Judaism after um, the fall of, uh, of, of, uh, of the temple. And we are in the same situation. Or we are also in the similar situation like St. Paul, St. Paul uh, in opposition to the apostles and also the apostle Peter, uh, found a way uh, to liberate the young Christianity from this uh, narrow context of one of the Jewish sect. And he transformed this message of Christianity as an uh, offering, as, a, as a something which is offered to all nations, to all cultures. There is uh, not so important if you are man or woman, if you are a Jew or a pagan, if you are um, a free man or the slave, né? the Christ is for everybody. So um, uh, something like this, it was a great uh, re contextualization of young Christianity uh, to away uh, from this narrow uh, narrow bounds of uh, one of the Jewish sect as, um, uh, as some offer for everybody and I think we are now in this situation if we read um, carefully uh, the Fratelli Tutti it is exactly the same we should go to uh, the universal fraternity, yes, the universal fraternity is an eschatological goal, but uh, in the history, we must uh, uh, do some steps toward this, this idea. Thank you. I think we have uh, still a little time for one or two questions, if there are one or two. It looks like uh, the the conference is very much in the reflection after you, your your speech and your answers uh, so far. The last chance, <laughs> and feel free. Oh, one more question. Thank you very much for your reflection, Professor. I wonder if you could maybe say a little bit more about the third group you mentioned, the group called the nuns, N-O-N-E-S, and maybe how we as, as religious congregations maybe can somehow do something in terms of reaching this particular group. Thank mm -hmm. you. Um, I have also uh, the local experience from the Czech Republic. And the Czech Republic is known as the most atheistic country in the world and so on. But if I speak with those so-called atheists, um, sometimes I ask, and how uh, the God looks like in which you don't believe? Uh, because if you uh, say no to some um, picture of God, uh, you must know something about him. So, and if he um, if he uh, uh, tells me something more about his uh, picture of God, I must say thanks to God that you don't believe in such a God. In such a God, I don't believe either. And then uh, the so-called atheist said, uh, but you know, I'm not so the materialist. I also know that something is above of us. Ne? This, this I call somethingness, somethingness. It is the most widespread religion in our country. Something must be. I don't believe in God, but something must be. And uh, our task is the hermeneutics of this something. Ne? And um, I think those so-called non-believers are uh, not 
non-believers. And they are the seekers. And um, uh, we should speak about, to listen to them, it is what the Pope Francis is always um, saying on the, uh, on the Synodal Pass. We must first to listen, to try to understand the people, and then to accompany them. So um, I think uh, we should uh, speak with uh, these people about their image of God. Um, because everybody has an image of God. And some people have a very, um, uh, and um, uh, they are also some destructive image of God. And some people are um, accepting this destructive image and, uh, and it's a tragedy. And some people are saying no to this image of God and they think they are atheists. But uh, it is only that nobody has shown them that God is uh, something uh, quite different than this destructive image. And uh, that uh, uh, God is what is sacred in the, in the love. Maybe we must go um, uh, together with the experience of love. And there is something sacred in the love sacred in our relations and then we can discover a new image of God which is understable for people and I think also this corona time was uh, some pedagogic of God né? the God closed our churches and said yes um, if uh, your Christianity was just to go on Sunday to the church I have closed these churches and you must now create a, way, a new way how to communicate with God. In some bishops' conferences, the bishops said, oh, follow the mass in the television. And some people are used to, uh, to follow the mass in the television. They don't return to the churches. It's uh, more easy to follow the mass in the television with the coffee and so. Uh, but I think the real presence of Christ needs the real presence of uh, the uh, faithful. And if uh, the real presence in the churches is not possible, it is the challenge to, uh, to seek a new way. So in some families, the people started to read if the churches were closed because of COVID, they started to read the gospel together and to speak about it. And for many, for many Catholic families, it was the first experience that they share their, uh, their, uh, um, their personal experience of faith their doubt, their, their, their questions. And I think it was the pedagogic of God. So uh, uh, we should uh, seek and find God in everything and in every situation. It is what the Pope Francis is um, uh, saying all the time. And also in this crisis, this crisis is all, always a challenge. Yes, if they are so many uh, pilgrimage and 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 prayers for for a new uh, uh, for a new priest vocations and nothing this is uh, less and less so uh, perhaps um, uh, God is saying us uh, don't knock on the door which I have closed and look for a new door I, I have uh, opened to you. So uh, we must be creative. Uh, we, 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 we must be courageous. Uh, it is not possible to go, uh, to continue in the ways uh, which are uh, the dead, uh, uh, um, uh, dead street. So um, I think uh, this our crisis, we must reflect and it is the reason why we are spiritual people, contemplative people. Uh, what is the contemplation? What is the, um, uh, what is the spiritual life? Not just to recite the Psalms. It is to go deeper and to try to understand 
what God is saying to us in the intelligent way, to have the open mind. And we should be the people of open mind, uh, creative, courageous. And, and then uh, this crisis and all these troubles should be the pain of birth, not the pain of dying. Thank you very much, Professor. It was very interesting to hear your thoughts and ideas, and thank you for sharing with us. I think all of us experience the lack of presence, and now we are enjoying it. And, and the, the idea, if I understood correctly, about going where the sacredness of relationships are, uh, I think we are going to follow your advice after a short break. <laughs> here in the Ola, we'll continue to talk on what you just said and we exchange experiences and, and talk um, about your ideas, but also about our own experiences uh, and inspired through your, your talk. But uh, for now, I'll thank, uh, thank you for, for, for agreeing, for being here, for sharing and inspiring us uh, today. Thank you very much. I thank you, and I'm uh, I'm uh, really convinced that God has a great trust in you. So <laughs> thank you, thank you. Yeah, and hopefully next time to see you in presence. <laughs> bye bye. <laughs> Here. Okay. Uh, so I think it was an interesting uh, talk.